I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to um, offer a couple of comments on the meditation. And I've noted some of the comments that have come into the chat. Um, the first is that in research on meditation and in various traditions, we find a loose distinction between two sort of clusters of types of meditation. Um, in one type of meditation, in effect, we're doing as little as possible. We're moving into just sitting, just being. Uh, open awareness is the technical term used commonly in research on this kind of meditation. We're simply present and the efforts we're making are the minimum amount necessary to essentially stay present. In that form of meditation, uh, we are in effect opening into everything and really undermining um, a kind of dualism between, you know, the one who is making an effort and everything else. So, okay, that's good. Opening into everything. And uh, in that kind of meditation, uh, sometimes it can be very accessible to have insights into the nature of experiences as made of parts that are connected and changing, thus empty of absolute solidity, identity, and the possibility of being possessed as a permanent or lasting source of happiness. Okay, open awareness. Then there are, and many of the uh, uh, mindfulness practices uh, that are increasingly popular in, in Western circles uh, are really about that kind of open awareness. Then we have focused attention practices. That's our technical term that involve essentially becoming absorbed in or becoming very focused on and resting attention on a particular thing, perhaps the sensations of breathing at the upper lip, or as we did here in this guided practice, um, really taking contentment uh, after taking lovingness and then the blending of the two as an object of attention. Well, even though in modern circles, open awareness practices tend to be most popular and tend to be most taught, certainly in the surviving written record of early Buddhism, focused attention practices, absorption practices, could be called samadhi practices or concentration practices, get the most attention. Uh, whether it's in the Satipatthana Sutta, the four establishings or foundations of mindfulness, uh, sutta, which is uh, full of very practical methods, or the Anapanasati Sutta, mindfulness of breathing, or in the focus on uh, the development of the jhanas in right concentration, uh, there's a tremendous focus on becoming absorbed in really, really useful states of awareness. And so I would just want to emphasize that because sometimes focused attention practices get a kind of a bad rap as being a goal directed or egoic or dualistic. And yeah, watch out for the pitfalls of getting really, as I have, overly caught up in attaining these states of mind and, you know, kind of achieving uh, and comparing with regard to them. All right, don't fall into those pits, but otherwise stay on the path. Uh, and it's very helpful to cultivate these qualities so that they become increasingly stable in us, including, as we understand more and more now, drawing on mechanisms of positive neuroplasticity that turn states of being into traits of being hardwired into our own body. Point two about that meditation is to explore contentment and lovingness. And if you think about it, a lot of our best efforts come from a loving place deep down inside. The expression might be complicated, but at bottom, the intention is good. I have a lot of background in um, developmental psychology and early childhood, 
And uh, young children, for example, you know, they can do all kinds of stuff. You know, they like uh, rub their mom's lipstick all over their face, or as our daughter did once when I was pouring a glass of milk and the glass, she, the, the glass became uh, full of as much milk as she wanted while I was pouring, and she just pulled the cup away because she had enough, you know? And, you know, the milk kept pouring on the table. She was about two, two and a half at the time. No problem. But, you know, the intent is good underneath it all. Even if, you know, they could use a little improvement in the tuning of the, of the way they go about doing it. So think of it as we have impulses that are at bottom good, which is a beautiful way to understand yourself. It's really important to explore what is the underlying good intent, even uh, in things that you regret. And I'll be focusing on regret uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So here we are. We have some kind of positive intention, and then it moves into expression. If we are in a frame of discontent at the time, how is that loving intention going to be expressed? It's probably going to be expressed in problematic ways. I was saying to our son Forrest recently that um, if you think of the distinction between making things happen and offering, making an offering into the world and seeing what it takes up, um, many of the good things that I've done in my life have come from a framework of making things happen. All of the bad things... <laughs> In my life, almost all of the bad things in my life have come from the framework of making things happen. So when lovingness meets discontent, that often puts us on the very slippery slope into problematic forms of making things happen, including lots of drivenness. So it's really powerful to... When something comes up to do, like you have a desire or an intention, a purpose, a project, to just tap the brakes for a moment, just pause and recenter yourself as best you can in an experience in the present of enough already. Content already. If only for a few seconds before you say that thing, to establish yourself in feeling, okay, I don't have to get pressured. I don't have to move into the feeling of craving. I don't have to get driven here. I don't have to be insistent. Whew. I can feel content already. And then through the field of that contentment, this good intention, this loving intention can move. That's an amazing combination, right? And it's really worth exploring. What is it like to be rested in contentment as wholehearted intentions, purposes, plans, strategies move through you? I'm sharing this in part because I need to learn more of it myself. Okay. So, and I am aware on the whole of what's coming through the chat. Um, I also want to say that one of our longtime participants, someone that I always look forward to seeing, I'm probably going to embarrass him now, Garrett Peltzer. I'm probably mispronouncing something here. Hello, Garrett. Joins us routinely from Thailand, where he's been living and teaching and working for many years. And soon he's going to return to his native Germany and in Europe, which is eight or nine years, eight or nine years, eight or nine hours. There you go. Eight or nine hours ahead of us here. It's going to be hard for him to join us live. So I just want to really appreciate you, Garrett. And also, frankly, appreciate many, many other regulars here. Uh, and I, I just want to try to say all your names. And also do appreciate that sometimes things change. People come, people go, and 
you know, there's a normal natural process. And Garrett knows that um, he and I are definitely going to be in communication with each other, even if he's not uh, coming here next week. Okay? All right. So let's see. Um, I'm scanning. Very good. Good. Okay. So as you know, I will, as you probably know, I always read all the chat. I can't always read it all the time during the, 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 the meeting here, but I will eventually have read it all. So you can be sure of that. So I would like to talk about a topic that is, I think, on the minds of many people that I've spoken with, um, especially as we age. And I'm probably not the only person here who's getting older every day. So, and that's the topic of regret. And I've seen on the whole people be really burdened by regret. And in my own process over the last several years, I've been really looking at my own mistakes in this life and things I regret. So it's a very, very, very fertile field of practice. And one that, as you will see, uh, opens into several deep, profound Buddhist themes. So I'd like to explore it with you. Now, in this exploration, it's very important to have resourced yourself as we did during the meditation. Aha, uh -huh, my strategy here. To resource ourselves so we have a sense of what it feels like to have a kind of refuge, our home base, um, even if we don't have as intense a sense of it right now that we did maybe during the meditation itself, Still, as we grow the trait of contentment and the trait of loving heartedness, uh, we can become increasingly able to access that trait in states of being in the moment. All right. So it's good to be resourced as we explore this territory of regret. And if there's anything about this that is just too much for you, you can tune out. You can also pick a, a very mild, minor topic or Thing that you regret, um, really take care of yourself here. So to enter into the topic of regret, it's important to resource oneself, point one. Point two, it's useful to be clear about what do we mean regret. So there are many kinds of regret. Regret at bottom basically is we feel sad about something that happened. Often we wish it hadn't happened. We often, related to regret, imagine how it would be or have been if that had not happened. Okay? Regret. And then sometimes along with regret, uh, in addition to the sorrow of regret, is guilt, shame, or remorse. Now, sometimes we regret events that we've had no control over whatsoever. For example, um, I regret that my mother um, grew up at a time that for her and generally women in America, there were very few opportunities, uh, period, including for someone who was pretty bright, my mother, and um, she just didn't have opportunities that would have been really wonderful uh, that more and more, thankfully, uh, in more and more developed countries women have access to, with many, many exceptions, with a long way to go, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, I regret, you know, I regret that for my mom. I did not make that happen. I cannot change that it happened, but I regret it. I wish she had more opportunity, okay? Um, we can regret political events. We can regret also things that have happened to us that we just were, unfor were unfortunate. Uh, it, was un it was bad luck. We were perhaps born with a certain kind of uh, limitation uh, in ourselves. Or we can also regret things like uh, we are targeted, not just based on luck, but based on deliberate intent. We are targeted by systems of oppression of one kind or another, discrimination, bias of one kind or another. Uh, we can regret those things. I'm not going to be exploring those categories. I'm going to be exploring with you here the kind of regret 
that um, often eats away at us in which we feel responsible for some kind of harm, some kind of impact, potentially to ourselves or to somebody else or other people. That's the kind of regret I want to talk about here. Okay, What are some examples of that? Um, I still regret uh, uh, some horseplay that I did with a friend of mine when we were both in seventh grade in which I was just too rough. It just comes back to me. Um, this is a, you know, I regret for complex reasons when I was a senior in high school, initially um, asking, a, a, I'll use the word girl, fellow high school student to the prom. And for complex reasons, including my own just deep shyness and embarrassment about being seen by others at a prom, um, I, I told her I just, I just couldn't do it. And I was really sad about that, but I couldn't do it. And I regret to this day, we're talking, oh, I don't know, 60 plus years ago, um, 50 years ago, certainly, just, uh, I, uh. I feel it, I regret it now. Uh, I know her name, wherever you are, I want to apologize. I don't want to say her name because it's her private nest, but man, if I ever met her, I would just tell her how much I regretted doing that. I, I wasn't mean about it. I wasn't bad about it. I have the right to, to, to back out, but I know she felt disappointed and sad and I just regret it. Okay, we regret those kind of things. I regret... Um, not to share all my dirty laundry with you, but I regret uh, basically swerving away from really focusing on my own career for the throughout my 20s. Uh, I did all kinds of other things and I learned a lot along the way and healed some things, but you know, I got a late start and that has had some consequences, you know, now in uh, my eighth decade. So, uh, you know, we can regret various things, many kinds of regrets. Uh, we can regret uh, continuing to drink too much when we knew we shouldn't. We can regret continuing to eat too much. Or we can regret um, staying too long in a relationship that just was never really, really going to have much cheese on that tunnel. We can regret those kinds of things. You know, there's a wide range here. So what I'd like to do is to offer some Buddhist perspectives about regret that I have found really useful. And then I'm going to move into a very practical, psychologically oriented set of practices with you that I've used and you can use yourself that can be very, very useful. And then next week, I'll be here and I'm going to follow up on this topic, including following up with people who've tried the practices that I'm going to offer to you here. All right? So strap on your seatbelt, roll up your sleeves. We're in the releasing regrets um, express here. So two Buddhist perspectives that are very useful. <clears throat> the first perspective is to ask oneself, what is a regret? As an experience, regrets are processes made of parts that are changing based on causes and conditions. They are processes. They are fluid in their nature. And when we get most burdened by regret, it's when we lose sight of its fluidity and, it, and we turn it into a solid or treat it as a solid approach it as a solid and and don't recognize its fluidity this is one of this is one of the sides of the coin i'll get to the other side of the coin of arguably the most precious the most precious jewel the most precious coin in all the buddha's teachings this matter of the emptiness of all phenomena, they exist emptily. They're fluid, they are processual, they're made of processes, and regret is, is of the same nature. And when we relate to regret in that way as a fluid experience, 
and we don't and we and we stop regenerating it through preoccupations and ruminations if we if we allow it to flow as an experience um, and if we then it doesn't seem so weighty and also if we start to recognize that the causes the variety of causes that created the regret were also very fluid when we open to looking at something that we regret in this fluid kind of way it's a lot easier to bear the other side of the coin of deep, deep dharma is to ask the question, not just what is regret, but who is regretting? What is regretting? What are you that you are regretting? Huh? And this goes to um, the question of moral responsibility. The Buddha was very, very, very pragmatic. And his focus was not on um, guilt or shame. His focus was on, huh, what leads to awakening? And along the way, pragmatically, what leads to awakening is to um, reduce harms to others and oneself. Uh, wise intention has three elements to it, and two of them have to do with not harming. Um, one is the intention to release Ill, Ill will, which is the movement to hurt, ill will. And also second intention, wise intention, is to not harm. And third is to release attachment to scent to pleasure. So we don't get so attached to it. We can enjoy it without getting caught up in it. That's wise intention. So um, it is true that it's useful to look at um, what we have done and to learn lessons from it. But it's not useful to add the excess and unnecessary suffering of continuing to beat ourselves up about it. So when you look at the you who did the thing, like the 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 Rick who um, told her that he, he just couldn't go to the prom, uh, the Rick who who, uh, or that, uh, who swerved away from certain career moves in his 20s. Who was that guy? Who are you that did that thing? What were you? What are you that maybe continues to do that thing? You too are a process made of many parts that are connected and changing. And this more expansive, expanding, opening up, unpacking sense of the I, the self, also really changes how we relate to regrets. Rather than thinking there's some sort of unitary I who did the bad thing then and deserves to continue to be burdened and punished today, we, we, we let that go. And we allow regret to arise as an experience, but we hold it more lightly. This is fundamental Buddhist teaching. What happened that we regret is, is like a river with many currents in it. The one, you know, the one, uh, the person who did that is also a river with many currents moving through it. When I look back on the two examples I've given you, I can recognize 20, 30 forces moving through me that led me to do those things. You know, This can be really quite abstract, but now I'd like to bring it down to earth with some practices here about regret, okay? So you can do this right now. If you're watching this on recording, you can use my guidance here to uh, move yourself through the steps while uh, turning the, putting the recording on pause from time to time to take more time. Or you can hear my suggestions, and that's all they are, and 
uh, adapt them to your own purposes and go off and explore them on your own. Okay? So here we go. Step one, we've already done establishing a sense of refuge, a sense of being in your home base, on your own side, calm, present, warm-hearted. Second, recall the insight that what we regret is fluid, made of many parts, swirling. Uh, I use the metaphor an eddy in a stream. What we regret has that nature. And the other side of the coin is that the doer, the doing of that which is regretted is also a process with many processes inside it. You are like that yourself. Aware of that. Then in the third step, picking something you regret. I recommend something mild or medium. If you're really resourced and you've worked with this stuff before, you can do something that's more severe. And take some moments to let yourself feel the regret. I suggest being aware of the body sensations of the regret. And I'm moving through this fairly briskly so we can end by 7.30 my time. But you can take your time with it, with the recording and on your own. This is a structured, well-constructed sequence I'm taking you through. So in the third step, we open to the experience, including its body sensations and its emotions. We might name these like sadness, anger at myself, remorse. We include our thoughts, our perspectives, our images related to the regret. We're still opening to the experience. And what I've observed that people do with regret is they hover in this middle place that's the worst of both worlds. They don't fully open to the experience, nor do they completely release it. They're stuck in the middle. We need to fully open to the experience in order to eventually release it. So at least we're not preoccupied by it. If we think about it, it may still hurt. It may still be an ouch. I'm still upset about what happened for me in high school with that girl. Um, in any case, but we're not preoccupied by it, okay? So in our third step, we're aware of thoughts and perspectives, and also we're aware of desires. Wishes that we had done something different, wishes that other people had been more helpful, maybe desires. And in the experience of regret, can be certain kinds of actions, like actions um, that we can sense in our body, uh, posture, facial expression, bracing, guarding, or um, actions that, as Peter Levine has pointed out, it would have been so good if we had taken or been able to take or been supported in taking at the time, but we just couldn't. Kind of thwarted coping of various kinds. Okay, so in the third step, we explore the experience, we unpack it, we open it up, including getting a sense of what's deeper. We need to resource ourselves to do this. Like I've said, 
but we uh, keep in mind also that things are made of parts that are connected and changing. So we unpack it. We unpack it. That's the third step of healing. Then in the fourth step, we take into account repairing. Okay? So we include what we have already done to address that which we regret. And taking some inventory here is really useful. Most people dramatically underestimate the legitimate amount of repair they've already attempted or made. Including the repair of never making that mistake again. The repair, perhaps, of reaching out to the person you hurt and talking with him about it, the repair of making amends, the repair of a kind of penance in a healthy sense. So take a look at what you've done to repair already. It could be really helpful if you have time, pick a regret and write, start writing out, what have you done to repair? You've perhaps developed greater insight you understand things better now. You've, you've acquired new skills so that you can act differently in the future. You've nudged your character more and more in a, in a more and more global direction, uh, such as becoming simply a calmer, more loving person. Um, how have you repaired? Okay, that's number four. And also in number four, how could you repair additionally? How else could you repair? Sometimes there's some real soul searching with this one. Sometimes you realize with hopefully relief, wow, <laughs> ain't nothing else. <laughs> you know? And there's nothing else reasonably to do, you know? Uh, I've been honest with myself. I have felt the feelings. I've copped to my stuff. I've admitted it. Uh, I've made, as they say in AA, a fearless and searching inventory. Uh, I'm walking a different road. I've done all that I can. Uh, or you might realize, you know, there's some, there's more that I could do. Okay, now that's repair. Fifth step, release. Release. In releasing, and releasing can also be happening somewhat along the way, but I'm marking these so far five aspects in sequence, although often we kind of spiral through them. We move through them as sectors almost more and more deeply. Release. You let things flow. You let the sadness flow. You know, you may be, you write a letter you never send. Uh, maybe you really let yourself vent in some safe place, like on the edge of the ocean by yourself probably, or elsewhere. Um, you know, you can feel things flowing out of your body. Often you can feel a kind of contraction around the regret and in the opening is a releasing. You give yourself the blessing, the benediction that you have repaired enough to let yourself release. Releasing doesn't mean that you um, give yourself a moral pass if there was something to be you know, remorseful about. I really wish, I, I didn't know how, but I really still wish you know, I'd done a better job of uh, letting her know that I just couldn't go to a prom. Uh, I was just too uptight, uh, you know, at 16. Uh, so, uh, you know, yeah. So releasing, releasing, letting it flow. That's the fifth phase.
releasing. Releasing beliefs that are just unrealistic, you know, like, well, I should have done better. How could you possibly have done better? You had no idea how to do better. You didn't know what better looked like. You didn't even know it existed, you know, given the set of options that your childhood and your culture and your upbringing and the, you know, the circumstances that you were in gave you, right? Letting go of, you know, beliefs that are punishing. Giving yourself um, the freedom to turn a corner. It, turning a corner means that you give yourself permission not to be preoccupied. The stuff may still come up, but you recognize your brain and the negativity bias and you think, you know, I got it, it arose, and I'm going to deliberately turn the channel. I'm deliberately turning a corner, not as a spiritual bypass, not as repressing anything. I'm just simply disengaging attention from that. I'm giving, I'm allowing myself to turn a corner because I've repaired enough. That's another aspect of releasing, okay? Five is releasing. Six, replacing. After we exhale, it's time to inhale. Replacing. And in the replacing, it's very power. One way to replace is to rest in your home base. Deep green, I call it, the green zone of peacefulness, contentment, and love, which we, two of which we explored in the meditation. All right. When we're rested in love, it's easier to bear the ways that we've hurt other people. I don't have any contact with that girl from 50 plus years ago. Uh, I wish her well. And um, still being rested in lovingness in general, huh? enables the regret to not sting so much or preoccupy me. So you can explore in terms of replacing regret the way that ways that loving heals regretting. Contentment heals different kinds of regrets. Peacefulness also heals certain kinds of regrets having to do with threats. Okay. Contentment heals regrets related to loss. Lovingness heals regrets related to breaches with other people and harms done to other people. So we're on number six, replacing. Uh, resting increasingly in the depths of your own nature, your true nature, is a kind of replacing. Also specifically, if you regret certain things that came from impulsivity, replacing a greater sense of self-regulation and equanimity and walking more evenly over uneven ground, being less reactive. Um, I'm working on replacing exasperation with patience. <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> replacing. So you might ask yourself, what are natural replacements for that which you are releasing. Replacing. And a key element, number six, replacing, is around forgiveness. Um, the best stuff that I've read on forgiveness was written by our son and me, I admit it, in the last chapter of the book, Resilient, uh, uh, particularly the section on the giving of forgiving. The last chapter is about generosity, including forgiving yourself. So one very penetrating, powerful um, replacement for regret on the foundation of everything else I've said, notably repairing and, really, and notably experiencing and repairing is forgiveness. And you can ask other people to forgive you for what you regret. If you're able to talk to the person you directly impacted, that's very powerful. 
uh, can be complex sometimes, um, and sometimes they're just not accessible. Um, they're not in our life anymore. Maybe they don't live anymore. But in any case, looking for ways to experience forgiveness related to the regret. It doesn't mean that you're changing your view of what happened and the values that perhaps you fell short of, but still there's a sense of forgiveness, of letting it go, of not beating yourself up about it, not being preoccupied with it. And you can forgive yourself. So whether others forgive you or you forgive yourself, that's a very useful kind of replacing related to practicing with regret. And then take a breath. Maybe this is number seven. It's basically take a breath and live, live well. Live well meanwhile, whatever the conditions are, as best you can. Uh, with a strong heart, you know, helping and healing along the way. Live well, meanwhile. Uh, it's really important to appreciate that for almost everybody, uh, the things in their life that are worthy of regret are a tiny fraction of all the things, all the good things they've ever done. But because of the negativity bias of the brain, um, we don't really notice that proportion. We don't notice that. We fixate on the handful of tiles in the overall mosaic that are, let's say, flashing red. And we just kind of glaze over all the mainly green or occasionally gray, neutral, beige tiles. And um, it's really important to, okay, I regretted those things. Who in this life gets through it without regret? All right. Meanwhile, woof. What do they say in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Be good to each other and party on. Okay, so. All right, what do you make of all this? I'm going to quickly take a look at the comments in the chat. Um, let's see. Easier said than done, somebody said. Yep. Um, yeah, as Liz points out, reaching out to others, you know, you want to be thoughtful about it. Um, and... Uh, um, yeah, be, be thoughtful. So like anything, you know, my seven, my seven part plan, um, you know, it's just an offering. See what's useful for you. Uh, this is a territory that I think a lot of us are grappling with, honestly, in our relationships and our life. We're burdened by regret. I think that, you know, so often we get burdened by regret and it just stops us from living bravely, living boldly, uh, taking a breath and going, okay, what the heck? That was that. Whew. Walk out the front door, uh, you know, head up, doing the best you can. Uh, yeah, you may be carrying with you depressed mood, trauma, the legacy of systems of mistreatment. You know, I'm not trying to diminish that whatsoever, but I'm talking about not adding the additional baggage, the additional bungee cords that, you know, you know, that hold us back, regrets, you know, the ballast in our balloons. I'm talking about not adding that to everything else you've got to deal with. Great. All right. So next week, I'm going to follow up and we're going to have big green stars, golden green stars, sort of, uh, for people who actually play with play. I see a person naming play. Play is good. Play with those seven steps. I suggest that you pick mild to, mild to moderate regrets, uh, resource yourself, uh, bail out of the exercise if it's overwhelming, uh, only do what's helpful for you, and then come back next week. And I'm going to be exploring with you what happened, how to go, we almost never talk about pr practice. I, I was, I've been on the board of meditation centers and been in a lot of practice environments. People rarely actually get real, you know, about 
hey, I tried this and it worked, or oh, I tried that and man, whoa, that didn't work for me at all. What do you think? You know, we don't, they don't share. Uh, but that's something that's really important to do.